This is A Word, a podcast from Slate. I'm your host, Jason Johnson. With the off-year elections behind us, many Democrats are feeling relieved and even triumphant after victories in Virginia, Kentucky, and Ohio. But how much does that really say about their prospects in 2024? And will Black voters really see their steadfast support of the party pay off? All these different ways that the sanctity of the ballot box is sort of chipped away at is attacked. That is still an incredibly important issue. Lessons from the off-year elections coming up on A Word with me, Jason Johnson. Stay with us. Welcome to A Word, a podcast about race and politics and everything else. I'm your host, Jason Johnson. Off-year elections are often viewed as a referendum on national politics, and given the dismal approval ratings of President Biden, many Democrats were feeling nervous before last Tuesday's elections. But instead of rebuke from voters, Democrats and the issues they support scored victory after victory from Cancun to Grant's tomb. In Virginia, voters gave control of the state legislature to Democrats, a roadblock to Republican Governor Glenn Youngkin's conservative agenda, and, reportedly, his presidential ambitions. In Ohio, voters defied state Republican leaders by legalizing recreational marijuana and enshrining abortion rights in the state constitution. And in Kentucky, Democrat Andy Bershear won re-election, beating back a challenge from Attorney General and Mitch McConnell protege Daniel Cameron. So the headlines are strong for Democrats and for many Democratic Black candidates who earned historic victories. But with the president's poll numbers sliding down and former President Trump gearing up for a rematch, will the party be leaning on another strong showing from black voters in 2024? And will voter suppression efforts around the country make that tougher? Joining us to talk about that is Brandon Tinsley. He's the national politics reporter for Capital B News, a nonprofit news organization focusing on issues that impact African-Americans. Brandon Tinsley, welcome back to A Word. Happy to be back, Jason. What is your overall take? What is your top line reaction to this past Tuesday's off year elections? Yeah, I think Tuesday showed first and foremost that Democrats can win if they campaign on certain issues. And one of the biggest issues on Tuesday was abortion. That was a through line in Kentucky where uh, the current governor, Andy Bashir. Uh, campaigned against uh, the state's harsh abortion ban. That was the case in Virginia, where Governor Glenn Youngkin uh, was really supporting the General Assembly candidates um, who were backing a 15-week abortion ban. That was also the case in Ohio, where voters, uh, they backed issue one. And, you know, in issue one was adding that constitutional amendment that enshrined abortion access. Um, And so I think if Democrats can take anything away from Tuesday night, uh, it's the fact that abortion for them is a winning issue. Let's talk a little bit about Virginia first. Glenn Youngkin ran and won on this sort of, I'm the nice, I'm a a cul-de-sac white Republican, right? But he really also was a culture warrior talking about critical race theory, talking about abortion, talking about limiting information about African-American history in schools. How bad does Tuesday's results, where Republicans lost the House, is that a repudiation of Yunkin's culture wars? Is that just Virginia returning to its natural state as a pretty solid blue state? What's a, a realistic assessment of what happened on Tuesday? Glenn Youngkin is still fairly popular in Virginia. Um, You know, he was not on the ballot, but in other ways, he was on the ballot on Tuesday. And so I think for him and for the Republican Party more broadly, uh, what Tuesday showed was that uh, be careful what issues you campaign around. Uh, There are clearly issues that uh, voters actually want to protect or they're not in line with the Republican line about those issues. And so, yeah, as you said, you know, Glenn Youngkin has been campaigning in the past against critical race theory. Um, You know, he has been sort of against laws or policies that would restore voting rights to people who had faced convictions. And so I think what Tuesday showed for Virginia is that if Democrats uh, maybe want to repeat the success in the future, really what they need to focus on is issues. I think maybe less of pointing at specific sort of like personalities and really looking at, oh, these are clearly the issues that are animating voters. And there are a whole host of culture issues. If you focus on these issues and their impact on people, that's how you develop a winning strategy. 
if Virginia is an interesting state when it comes to black voters, because first off, you have large number of African-Americans, you have a large number of HBCUs, and then you have the large number of sort of educated middle class black people who you know live in sort of the D.C. suburbs and everything else like that. The state is also going to be facing a very interesting change uh, heading forward. As we know, in the state of Virginia, uh, you know, governors are term limited out after one term. And Youngkin's lieutenant governor is a woman named Winsome Sears. Did Winsome Sears, she's an African-American, strident, strident, Trump or Republican, way more so than Glenn Youngkin. Did she play a role in this past Tuesday's elections? Was she out there really stomping for him? Was she able to have any impact one way or another? Because it seems to me that black voters soundly rejected Youngkin and his policies and his black lieutenant governor didn't seem to help much. Yeah, I mean, there's no non-crass way to put this, but I don't know how much black voters really care about her. Someone like Winsome Shears shows that gulf, or, and also somebody like Daniel Cameron in Kentucky, it shows that gulf between black Republican officials and black voters. Black voters overwhelmingly vote Democratic or lean Democratic. And uh, when you have, uh, you know, someone like Glenn Youngkin's a backer, like Winsome Shears, I think what you're really seeing is that she doesn't really figure in influencing black people's uh, decision on how they cast their ballot. It looks like now the Virginia state legislature, uh, the state house is going to have its its first black speaker. But also what you see is a sort of rallying of African-American voters on certain kinds of issues. Is there a way in which the dangers of, we already know critical race theory and how African-American voters are galvanized by that, but was the possibility of a statewide abortion ban uh, or Glenn Youngkin's, you know, really only 15 weeks. Was that a galvanizing factor for black voters? Because I think a lot of times that's underestimated. You know, the, the images we see about abortion are white women and pink hats, but it's important to black voters, too, right? Absolutely. Um, and I think you can paint a, a broader picture with some of these issues and how they affect black voters. Right. And so, for instance, in Ohio, where voters on Tuesday elected to enshrine abortion access into the state constitution. That's a state where black women are more likely than their white counterparts to die from pregnancy related challenges. And so when we think about how an issue like abortion, how issues like, um, you know, pregnancy challenges affect black people um, in these states, Black people, because of various other health disparities, are often overrepresented when we think about how they're affected by these issues. And so I think that, including for Black voters, rallying around um, abortion rights, abortion access, is something that would pay off when it comes to courting um, or gaining the support of Black voters for Democrats. We're going to take a short break and we come back more on the impact of Black voters in the off-year elections. This is A Word with Jason Johnson. Stay tuned. Breaking news can be challenging to consume nowadays, and if you're constantly doom scrolling on social media, it can really take a toll. If this sounds like you, check out Up First on NPR. Up First frees you from the all day scroll obsession by telling you everything you need to know in an easy 15 minutes. No BS, just the facts. Up First is the cure you need for news fatigue. Up First provides the top three news stories to start your day with digestible 10 to 15 minute episodes. It's all the news you need so you can get back to your life and feel informed without losing your mind in the process. With the elections in 2024, pending indictments, AI and more. We know it's going to be chaos. The show provides a concise description of the top news headlines of the day, bringing listeners up to speed quickly on what's happening in the world. Let Up First guide you through the news cycle so you can save your energy for the kids, errands, or the new season of your favorite reality show. Stay informed every morning with Up First. Listen now to Up First from NPR wherever you get your podcasts. This is Jason Johnson, host of A Word, Slate's podcast about race and politics and everything else. I want to take a moment to welcome our new listeners. If you've discovered a word and like what you hear, please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. And let us know what you think by writing us at a word at slate.com. Thank you. You're listening to A Word with Jason Johnson. Today, we're talking about the off-year elections with political reporter Brandon Tinsley. We're going to turn our attention to Kentucky 
where black Republican Daniel Cameron fell short of his challenge to Governor Andy Brashear. There's a lot of attention being paid at the national level to the role of abortion in that defeat, but Cameron was targeted by groups like Black Voters Matter Action Pack for his role in limiting the prosecution of the police responsible for killing Breonna Taylor in 2020. I want to play a clip of these ads and talk about it on the other side. What's up, Kentucky? It's election time, and all skin folks ain't kin folks. Over the past few years, we've taken to the streets to demand racial justice, to demand health care, and the right to make decisions about our body. And now Uncle Daniel Cameron is threatening to take us backwards. The same man who refused to seek justice for Breonna Taylor now wants to run our whole state. We can't let that happen. We won't let that happen. So, Brandon, this is one of the things that, that really gets me about Kentucky. There's there's not a lot of politicians that I loathe, but Daniel Cameron might be one of them. And Daniel Cameron is sort of the epitome of the black Republican that black people loathe. Talk a little bit about the role of sort of black antipathy towards him, what he did in the Breonna Taylor case, how he sort of presented himself, who he's allied himself with that galvanized black voters to say, we can't have this guy as governor. I think in the minds of Republicans, Daniel Cameron is the sort of black person they think black voters want. And I think that's infantilizing because really what they're saying is black people will vote for a black candidate, uh, whereas what's actually true is black people will vote for the person who supports issues in the way that they support those issues. So with someone like Daniel Cameron, who decided not to bring charges against the officers who fatally shot Breonna Taylor, um, someone who uh, has really railed against uh, the positions that black voters take on a variety of issues, why would black voters vote for him? They're not going to vote for him just because like, oh, we want like a, a black governor. Um, and so uh, I think the antipathy came from the fact that Daniel Cameron is at odds with what black voters want. And I think it's, um, you know, in, in a lot of ways, I think it really is as simple as that. And here's the thing. I also think the test cases for Daniel Cameron are like Andrew Gillum, believe it or not, in Florida, and also Ken Blackwell uh, in Ohio. Ken Blackwell was a incumbent Republican secretary of state. He ran for governor in 2006 in Ohio. George Bush liked him. Republicans said he was great. He got the doors beaten off him. He got beat. Andrew Gillum, everybody thought Gillum was going to do great. And then his white support sort of cratered in a state where everybody thought Andrew Gillum was going to get there. Even though Daniel Cameron had been elected attorney general, it seems like his white support cratered. He did not do as well in rural, white, red counties in Kentucky as Trump did, as other Republicans did. Do you think it was not just black people saying, we can't have a man with Breonna Taylor's blood on his hands in the governor's mansion, but was it white folks saying, we're only going to let you go so far? Yeah, and I, I think this issue is maybe underreported because it makes a lot of people very uneasy. And I have I don't have any hard data on it, but I do think it is a very important and very fair question to ask, which is what are white voters, in this case white voters in Kentucky, what are they okay with power looking like in their state? You know, attorney general is a very different position from uh, the governor of the state, you know, the highest position in that state. And so I don't think that it is an unfair or crass question uh, to ask if white people in Kentucky are OK with the face of power in their state being a black guy, even if that black guy is somebody who stands in the same place on issues as they do. Uh, somebody who is has, you know, got the endorsement, the blessings of Donald Trump. At the end of the day, I think you do have to ask, you know, what are people, what do people want power to look like um, and how are they going to vote accordingly? We're going to take a short break and we come back more about the off year elections with political reporter Brandon Tinsley. This is a word with Jason Johnson. Stay tuned. Today, hip hop dominates pop culture, but it wasn't always like that. And to tell the story of how that changed, I want to take you back to a very special year in rap. 88, it was too much good music. The world was on fire. fire yeah. I'm Will Smith. This is Class of 88, my new podcast about the moments, albums, and artists that inspired a sonic revolution and secured 1988 as one of hip-hop's most important years. We'll talk to the people who were there. 
And most of all, we'll bring you some amazing stories. You know what my biggest memory from that tour is? It was your birthday. Yes, and you brought me to Sade. Life-size <laughs> cardboard cutout. <laughs> this is Class of 88, the story of a year that changed hip-hop. Listen to Class of 88 wherever you get your podcasts. You can binge the entire series right now on the Amazon Music app or Audible. You're listening to A Word with Jason Johnson. Today, we're talking about the off-year elections and the implications for 2024. Our guest is national political reporter Brandon Tinsley. Brandon, this was a very interesting election Tuesday as well, because in a different kind of political environment, you saw a lot of, of potential presidential candidates have their dreams shattered, right? Daniel Cameron... 37-year-old black man, had he gone from attorney general to governor of Kentucky, he automatic would have been on the short list to be anybody's vice presidential pick. You know, obviously Donald Trump in 2024 or even 2028, right? If Glenn Youngkin manages to flip the Senate to the Republicans and keep the House in the hands of Republicans, it would have said, oh, hey, Glenn Youngkin is this great chance. But none of it matters, because we still know who the Republican nominee is going to be. How does it change the importance of off-year elections when the top two positions of both parties are kind of locked in? I mean, it, no matter what these guys did, Donald Trump is still going to be the Republican nominee and Joe Biden is still going to be the Democratic nominee. I think that's true. But I also think that, you know, uh, these elections are important on their own terms. They're important outside of what it means for the 2024 presidential tickets. The person who is running Virginia, the person who is running Kentucky, the person who's running Mississippi, you know, any other state, they still can and do make incredibly important decisions that affect uh, their constituents' lives. You know, somebody like Andy Bashir in, in Kentucky, he has been uh, pretty good about using his executive power to get past Republican-controlled state legislator. That's important when we think about, you know, the voting rights that he's given back to hundreds of thousands of people in the state. When we think about the COVID um, uh, precautions uh, that he took, uh, that he won a legal battle uh, with state legislators over. But, you know, these things also matter. It doesn't uh, change the fact that we basically already know who's going to be on, you know, running for president for the Democratic Party, the Republican Party. But these elections matter on their own terms and they still affect people in a day to day way. Let's go a little bit lower into some of the granular races and just want your quick thoughts on maybe some of these. We see uh, in the city of Houston mayoral race um, that Sheila Jackson Lee is in a runoff. So she's an African-American woman, was a member of the Congressional Black Caucus. She's now going to be in a runoff election. We saw that one of the former exonerated five has now been elected uh, to city council in New York City. We saw that the city of Philadelphia just elected their first African-American woman mayor. What are we seeing on the ground as far as local black candidates, too? Because I think sometimes we forget that, as you pointed out, these local races still matter. What does it mean that black folks are still becoming the first in major metropolitan areas and, and cities? I was laughing about this earlier this week, laughing uh, not because it, it doesn't matter, but I was just laughing at the fact that. We're still having these kinds of firsts in 2023 in Rhode Island um, with uh, Gabe Amo, who uh, won the special congressional election. He's going to be the first black person uh, to represent Rhode Island in Congress. I think that's kind of a wild sort of fact to have in 2023. And, and I think if you draw a through line across uh, these different sorts of races, uh, it, it shows how much work there still is to be done when it comes to advancing and promoting sort of black political power, black elected power in a variety of states. You know, often we talk about places in the deep South, but we still see um, the importance uh, or we're still seeing these black firsts um, in places in, you know, in the North and the Northeast um, as well. So I think it, it shows that as much as some people want to rail against sort of a focus on, you know, identity and races and political contests and things like that, I think it matters because we still see that there's such a lack of Black representation across the board. And we have to interrogate why is there that lack of Black political representation? One of the issues that you talked about the last time we had you on the show was voter suppression. While you don't have a lot of races from this last Tuesday that people are still arguing about or fighting about one way or another, we did see 
in stereoscopic sound for everyone to notice the issues of voter suppression in the Mississippi race, where we had the Republican Tate Reeves was reelected, but you had large black voting areas that ran out of ballots multiple times, people waiting in line for hours, people being intentionally or mistakenly misdirected to the wrong polling places. And at the same time, you saw in the state of Pennsylvania, where the Supreme Court stayed in the hands of sort of Democrats, which will have a huge impact on early access to voting, voting rights, et cetera, et cetera. At the state and granular level, what did these off-year elections tell us about the role that voter suppression might play, either from the law standpoint or from just the practical on the ground standpoint heading into 2024? I think it tells us first and foremost that it, it's it's still an issue. Um, you know, I think back to after the 2020 presidential election, and you saw just uh, these wave, wave after wave after wave of restrictive voting measures uh, that were being introduced, that were being passed in Republican-controlled state houses um, across the country. And I think since then, that issue hasn't been as visible. You know, maybe people have moved on a bit, but there's less rallying, I think, on a sort of uh, high national level around the fact that voting rights still are under siege. But when we look at some of these local races uh, this past Tuesday, I think these races should have also been a reminder uh, that this is still an issue. It hasn't gone away. You know, redistricting is still an issue. Long voting lines are still an issue with the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. Um, you know, as we get closer to 2024 and as we get past that election, issues like mail in um, mail in, mail ballots, that could be an issue. Election certification. Uh, but the ways all these different ways uh, that the sanctity of the ballot box is sort of um, is chipped away at is attacked. That is still an incredibly important issue, and we're seeing it. Uh, we're seeing glimpses of it also play out on the local level, um, and we saw it just this uh, past Tuesday with some of these races that you mentioned, especially in a place like Mississippi, which you know I'm laying a mandate at my own feet as well to really pay attention uh, to a place like Mississippi, which it almost boggles the brain uh, just how um, horrible. There's no other way to put it. How horrible uh, the state voting rights voting protection is there. So heading into this week, all the headlines, all the hang wringing and rending of cloth was about, you know, Joe Biden. Oh, he's doing terrible. He's dragging down everybody. And in particular, he's losing young voters and, and he's losing African-American voters to Donald Trump. And to me, the, the test case for that would have been. Daniel Cameron in Kentucky. If Republicans were really making ground with black voters, then Daniel Cameron shouldn't have gotten blown out of the water the way he was. He would have been able to at least match the 15 percent Republicans usually got. But in a larger sense, did the black turnout in support of, you know, issue one in Ohio and the black turnout in critical districts like the Fredericksburg district, where you had a black Republican versus a black Democrat in Virginia, did black turnout for Democrats in this past election change or should it change the narrative about Joe Biden's potential challenges with black voters in 2024? Or is it, hey, these were just local races and this may not translate into him next year? Yeah, I mean, I think in some ways, sort of all of the above, um, in terms of these are local races, it's hard to sort of extrapolate beyond that what it could mean for on a national level. Uh, but also, we're still very far out um, from the 2024 election, uh, presidential election. And so I think if, you know, the election were tomorrow or next week, that's one thing, but it's not. And so uh, I I see it as maybe an early sort of like wake up call or thing to keep in mind is like, OK, if you're a Democrat, you can see the issues that are really galvanizing uh, voters, black voters in particular, pay attention to that, uh, maybe do a better job of messaging, sort of communicating to your black constituents like, hey, look at what we've done, look at what we're about, vote for us, and this is what we're going to keep doing. Um, I don't think the Democratic Party is always like really great about like hyping itself up about what it's done. And so, yeah, I, I really do think that there's a sort of overemphasis on, oh my God, look at how Biden is polling right now. And I'm just like, okay, I think we should like focus on the issues that are doing well for Democrats uh, because multiple things can be true at once. Biden at the time of these pollings isn't super popular at all. Um, and also Democrats are still winning when they campaign around certain issues. Brandon Tinsley is a national policy reporter for Capital B News. Thank you so much for joining me today on A Word. Thank you for having me. And that's A Word for this week. 
The show's email is a word at slate.com. This episode was produced by Christy Taiwo Macanjula. Ben Richmond is Slate's Senior Director of Podcast Operations. Alicia Montgomery is the Vice President of Slate Audio. Our theme music was produced by Don Will. I'm Jason Johnson. Tune in next week for Word. <laughs>